Welcome to Basic Prayer. The teaching series within this podcast is a part of the Basic Discipleship Program. In Luke 11, 1, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Our hope is that this material will equip you with basic Bible truth so that you can have a strong and effective prayer life. Now, let's join today's lesson. Hey, welcome to this session of Basic Discipleship. And uh, this lesson within the Basic Discipleship series on prayer. This is our series on basic prayer. And in our lesson this week, we're talking on this, uh, speaking on this subject, prayer as a way of life. Prayer as a way of life. You know, prayer can often be likened to a new gym membership at the beginning of the year. A well-meaning Christian takes part in a study like this. Uh, They hear some important biblical truth about prayer. It gets them excited, fired up. They want to be faithful in this area, and so they make a new commitment. And then what happens? After a short season, they fizzle and fade, and prayer just isn't a part of their life. I'm convinced that in order to be prayer warriors, in order to experience all of the blessing that comes our way, through powerful and faithful prayer, we've got to get to the place where prayer is simply a a way of life, Uh, kind of like brushing our teeth or bathing or even eating, hopefully. Prayer's got to become just something we do by nature of who we are in Christ. I read an article this past week in Runner's World magazine. I was reading on how to become a better runner. And uh, in, in that article, one talked about how that, uh, you know, to be a good runner, pray, running, running has got to become, you know, a default uh, pattern of life. It's got to become something that you just do, a part of who you are, if you really want to be a good runner. And so I think we can say the same thing for prayer. If we really want to tap in to the peace, to the provision, and the power that comes through prayer, This thing has got to become a part of the fabric of our daily lives. Now, the the question we have is, how can we do that? And in this lesson, I want to speak under two subject headings in order to encourage us in this regard. And and first of all, I I think it will help us to do this. I think it will first help us to remember the true nature of prayer. Remember the true nature of prayer. See, a lot of people have misconceptions of of what's involved in this thing called prayer. And as a result, they just don't pray. I I can think of my experiences as a pastor. I get to talk to a lot of people about their spiritual journey. I've talked to folks many times about this thing called prayer. And sometimes I've had some of the most innocent questions aimed my way. You know, people ask, is it all right to pray for myself? Does God ever get mad if I ask for the wrong type of things? What should I say when I pray? I'm aware that there's a lot of folks who just have a a real misunderstanding when it comes to the true nature of prayer. And, And if we don't grasp what's really involved in this spiritual discipline, we'll be so unlikely to make prayer a way of life. So so consider three commitments that will help us engage in real praying. Number one, I would encourage you to make prayer conversational. Make it conversational. This is the true nature of prayer. Prayer is a conversation with God. I remember attending a student camp growing up down in South Georgia, uh, below the Nat Line, Moss hanging from the trees, sweltering hot. If you opened your mouth, you would get a mouthful of gnats. The joke was that they, was that they took students to this camp because it was so hot, uh, kids would be scared to go to hell. And when the invitation was given at the Tabernacle outdoor worship facility, students would be likely to respond. So that was kind of the joke. But anyways, I can remember uh, my counselor one year after evening time in the tabernacle we went back into um, our dorm um, uh, uh, kind of a our sleeping chambers 
concrete floor, wooden bunk beds, no real walls, screened in. Uh, it's kind of like a screened in patio area. So we're really sleeping outside with just a roof over our head. But I remember hearing the lesson that night on prayer in our, our dorm, in our cabin. And uh, the, the youth pastor who was teaching that night taught on prayer. And I remember him giving us this simple definition of prayer. He had us repeat it after him. He said this, prayer is talking to God. Prayer is talking to God. Now, I didn't leave that evening um, with a fresh commitment to prayer. In fact, it was years before I started praying faithfully. It was years before prayer became a way of life for me. But that definition always stuck with me. And years later, I was able to go back to that definition. I was reminded that this is the fundamental essence of prayer. Here's why many people don't pray. They don't see the simplicity of prayer. It is simply a conversation with God. So some would say, I don't know what to say. Hey, just talk to God. Well, what if I say the wrong thing? Guess what? You may say the wrong thing. I probably say the wrong thing a lot. He's a holy, perfect, awesome God, all wise, all knowing, everywhere, present. Surely I'm going to say some things at times that fall short of his standard, but I can have this assurance. He loves me and he's called me to talk to him. We see this fundamental definition of prayer as early as Genesis 4, 26. The Bible there speaks of the beginning of time and how people related to God before the, the Mosaic law was given. The Bible says a son was born to Seth also, and he named him Enosh. And then the Bible makes this statement. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Notice this word call. It's a relational word, a conversational word. We use the word often today to speak of calling someone on the phone. And we know what the term means. It means to address a person. It means to utter words in order to get their attention. And that's what prayer is. It is you speaking to your heavenly father calling upon him. Prayer is talking to God. You could look at Genesis 12, 8 to see another example of this type of prayer. And then know this, throughout the New Testament, we see this Greek word used for prayer that simply means, it simply conveys the idea of approaching God. The New Testament uses a Greek word for prayer that was used in the ancient world of approaching a deity. And the New Testament uses that word to describe the act of prayer. Prayer is approaching God. Prayer is calling upon the Lord. Prayer is talking to God. So relax, take a deep breath, chill out, enjoy your prayer life, and realize that this is fundamentally what prayer is, simply talking to God. Number two, I want you to see that prayer should be continual. So make prayer conversational, but also make prayer continual. Uh, we see this instruction in Scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. We're told to pray without ceasing, or as some translations would have it, pray constantly. We're told in Ephesians at chapter 6 that we're to pray always and at all times with all supplication. Every season, every circumstance, every struggle, every trial, every temptation, every tragedy or testing in life is an opportunity to pray. We should pray in the good times and in the bad times. We should pray in the prayer closet. But we should also learn the secret, secret of praying intermittently throughout the day. Pray without ceasing. I see another example of this in Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, if you're familiar with the Bible, there Nehemiah is in exile. He's one of God's chosen people, and he's in exile. And he has this vision from the Lord, this burden from the Lord to go back to his capital city and to engage in some construction projects to rebuild Jerusalem. But he's nervous because he, he, he works for the king and he knows if the king of this 
foreign land to which he's been carried exile, hears about his heart's desire, the king may become enraged and even have him put to death. What do you mean go back to your homeland and rebuild the capital city? My people have your people under subjection. You can't go back. And so Nehemiah was burdened, but he was also conflicted. The Bible tells us in Nehemiah chapter 2 that Nehemiah was before King Artaxerxes and serving wine before him. And Nehemiah says in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I'd never been sad in his presence. Why are you sad, Nehemiah? Because he's got this burden to go back to his homeland. So the king said to me, why are you sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. The king depicts from his ca- the, the king from Nehemiah's countenance understands something's wrong. And Nehemiah says, I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So he expresses his heart's desire to the king. And then listen to what happens. Verse four, then the king asked me, what is your request? So the king gets straight to the point. He asked Nehemiah, what do you want, Nehemiah? Now, Nehemiah knows he wants to travel back to his homeland and engage in construction projects to help rebuild the walls of the city. But he's afraid to, to say that because he knows this could lead possibly to him losing his job or worse yet, being executed. It could be counted as treason. What does Nehemiah do? Verse 4. After the king asks ask this, immediately Nehemiah prays. Look at what he says. He says, so I prayed to the king of heavens and answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. Now notice what Nehemiah did. He's asked a question by the king. He responds to the king. But in between receiving this question and answering, he somehow utters a prayer to the Lord. Notice what's going on in Nehemiah's life. He's learned the secret of 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. He knows how to pray without ceasing. He doesn't just pray in his prayer closet. No, he knows how in the various circumstances of life to have an ongoing conversation with the Lord. And this is so important. If you want prayer to become a habit of life, you can't have this type of prayer life where you just simply pray in the prayer closet and then you go throughout your day forgetting God. Notice the biblical imperative. The Lord wants us to learn how to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean we are always praying. That's impossible. We've got to work. We've got to interact with people. We've got to eat. We've got to sleep. We can't pray literally at all times. What does it mean? It means we're always in the attitude of prayer. And it requires spiritual development, spiritual maturity to get there. But know this, that's the true nature of Christian prayer. So make prayer conversational. Make prayer, secondly, continually. Thirdly, I would say, make prayer consecrated. Make prayer consecrated. What do I mean by that? Well, your prayers need to be focused on the will of the Lord. Have your prayers devoted to and consecrated for the will of God. So much prayer fails because it is focused on self-will instead of God's will. When prayer fails for these reasons, people become frustrated in prayer. They say, I give up. I've tried that before. Didn't work. Didn't get the answer to prayer I wanted. But get this, when we pray according to God's will, we are guaranteed from Jesus that he will hear us and answer our prayers. And when we receive answers to prayers, we are more likely to pray. Jesus said it like this in John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Jesus promises whatever you ask in his name, he will answer it. He will do it. Now the question is, what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? 
Does that mean that we just tack on this phrase at the end of our prayers where we say, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if it's a really big and important prayer, we might pray something like this at the end, in the most matchless and wonderful and high and exalted name, amen. Is that what Jesus was encouraging us to do? Well, I believe you could perhaps see a precedent for saying, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I, I do that. But I think there's something more in Jesus' words. Jesus here is encouraging us to pray prayers that could be assigned to his name. In other words, he's encouraging us to pray prayers that are in alignment with his name or in alignment with his character. He's encouraging us to pray the type of prayers that you could, upon which you could place a name tag that says Jesus He's encouraging us to pray prayers that are in accordance with who he is, his will, and his ways. I think of it like this. My, one of my children, man, he really likes to eat. I can remember a time when he was really young, we went out to a fried catfish restaurant. We were taking some friends out to eat, and the fried catfish hit the table, and he was too young to be eating food like that. He was still on his you know, pureed carrots and, and, and formula, right? But uh, when the food hit the table, I was uh, talking to some of our friends and out of my peripheral vision, I saw on the woman's plate that a, a big filet of fried catfish was kind of hopping across the table. And I looked to see my, my son pulling the catfish by the tail and he grabbed it and held it up to his mouth and got ready to eat it. And people would watch that and say, man, that boy is a lot like his daddy. He's a lot, he's a Latham. Boy, he loves food. You see, people could say that Latham's like to eat. The two things go together. You could place the name Latham on eating. Now, I hope that illustration helps you. What does Jesus mean here? Look at the content of your prayers. Look at what you're praying. Is it the type of prayer God will answer? Ask yourself this. Can you put a name tag with the name Jesus on that prayer. If not, it may not be the type of thing he'll answer. If so, you have a promise from his word that he will answer your prayer. And know this, when you pray consecrated prayers, when you pray Jesus type of prayers, you've got a guarantee in the good book that the Lord's going to answer. And when the Lord's answering your prayers, you're going to be more fired up, more excited to pray. If you want prayer to be a way of life. Remember the true nature of prayer. You need to make prayer conversational. You need to make prayer continual. You need to make prayer consecrated. So that's our first idea. Secondly, I want, I want to speak on, the, on this subject. In order to make prayer a way of life, make sure you build prayer supports into your life. Build prayer supports into your life. We've got to have things that regularly encourage us and motivate us to prayer. We've got to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves when it comes to our strategy for prayer life. We, we've got to grab ourselves by the spiritual nap of the neck and make sure we have systems and structures in life that encourage and facilitate a devoted prayer life. I think of three quickly. Number one, I think of this idea of accountability. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the countenance of another. I would encourage you, get an accountability partner. Get someone who regularly asks you, have you been praying? I have a friend with whom I talk every Friday or most every Friday, some Fridays we miss, and we have a list of questions we ask ourselves. We want to regularly check ourselves and, and perform an evaluation of how we're doing with spiritual disciplines and other areas of life. One question he asked me, though, is, how's your prayer life? Get a person who asks you something similar regularly. It doesn't have to be a phone call every Friday. Maybe it's a Sunday school, somebody in your Sunday school class or life group who regularly checks on you on Sunday morning or whenever you get together and says, how's your prayer life? It'll help you. Number two, get some prayer partners. 
And by that, I mean, get some people with whom you regularly pray. James 5.16 tells us to pray for one another. I I can remember a man approaching me at one season of my life, a deacon in a church in which I serve. And he said, Pastor, as I serve as a deacon, I'd like to meet with you if possible. Every Monday, pick a time. We picked 4.30. And, And he met with me almost every Monday for the span of about two years and prayed with me. And can I tell you, it was during that season of life that I experienced just fresh new growth in my prayer life. The Lord used that regular check-in on Monday as like gasoline on my spiritual fire to, to ignite a fresh passion and commitment to prayer. I can tell you this, if you have a weekly or monthly or every other weekly type of prayer partner in your life, it'll do something to rejuvenate your commitment to prayer. Consider using a prayer partner. And then lastly, I would encourage you to keep some written records. Use a prayer journal. Use note cards. Use the fly leaf of your Bible. Get a moleskin notebook. Use the notes app or a word processor on your smart device, your phone, or your computer. Keep list. Record answers to prayer. There's something about this discipline of writing that encourages our prayer life. I think it's for this reason, when you read the Old Testament, you see in places like 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10, the saints of old recording prayers. Why? Because they knew that their recorded prayers would serve as a catalyst for prayers in the future. Oh, keep a collection of what you've been praying. Keep written records. And who knows how it will bless you and encourage you. And maybe in future generations, someone will find your written prayers, your prayer requests, your prayer praises, answers to prayer, your prayer journals. And who knows how that will encourage someone else to pray. So work hard and pray so that prayer can become a way of life. Thank you for joining us today for our lesson on basic prayer. Stay current with other episodes by subscribing to our podcast or visit us online at basicdiscipleship.net. If you have any questions about the material presented in this lesson or if you would like to give feedback, email us at info at basicdiscipleship.net. Thanks for listening.